During the interview, India revealed that they'd called the police on J.K. Rowling and that J.K. Rowling could be arrested. And then J.K. Rowling responded to it, and I ended up just calling J.K. Rowling a c And I think she's been driven to breaking point, actually. Over time, the longer you spend on Twitter, I, it naturally, I think, you just get drawn, drawn down more of kind of extreme rabbit holes. It is seen on the left on Twitter as okay to call J.K. Rowling a c because we don't see people as human beings on the other side of our politics anymore. So, Kellen, welcome to Trigonometry. Uh, you are in the process of leaving Byline Times following a conversation that you hosted with India Willoughby, who's, by the way, a former guest of our show, uh, although it was a very different India Willoughby that came mm -hmm. on our show, I think, it's fair to say. Uh, and then there was a big spat with J.K. Rowling involved and, and some nasty things being said and apology and whatever. So why don't you tell us what happened? I, so I've run Byline TV for four years. It's a little bit different to the paper. It's editorially, it was something I was... I was deciding, you know, what we, who we interview and who we have on the shows. Um, and I saw on Twitter that J.K. Rowling had misgendered India, if that's what you want to call it, called him a man. And uh, it was in the news and it was really shocking, um, apparently to a huge number of people. So I DM'd India and said, hey, do you want to come on Byline TV and talk about this? Um, and they accepted, got a train down the next day. Because I, I just thought this was a really newsworthy thing. This is mm -hmm. what I've been doing for the last four years is covering things that are current, interesting, generally culturally interesting. There was not really an agenda or anything behind it. Um, and on during the interview, India revealed that they'd called the police on JK Rowling um, and that JK Rowling could be arrested, which is a huge, like, just basically a huge story, right? Mm -hmm. It was uh, shocking to hear. Um, so. I rushed out and put that out. J.K. Rowling has definitely committed a crime. I'm legally a woman. She knows I'm a woman. And she calls me a man. Well, I've been to the police and I've reported it as an issue. I contacted uh, Northumbria Constabulary yesterday. Um, so you reported J.K. Rowling to the police? I have reported J.K. Rowling to the police for what she said. Calling a trans person, a man, deliberately, knowing that that person is a woman, and I am a woman, regardless of what JK Rowling Boy. says. I've been through everything that's required of me. My birth certificate says female, my passport, all of my documents. It is a hate crime, and it should be treated just as somebody calling a black person the N-word, or an Asian per person uh, the P-word. I, something I expected to get, you know, coverage in the press, maybe a million views, but it exploded way beyond anything I'd ever posted in my like political life on the left or the right. With something like 21 million views in a day. And then JK Rowling responded to it and was like, oh, uh, this is nonsense. This is poor journalism. This is garbage. And then started personally attacking me for the whole day with 11 personal tweets, Googling my past, saying I was a grifter. Uh, saying that I and then and then literally was 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 tweeting um, my response to the interview, saying that I was calling India a him, which I literally wasn't. If you watch the video, it says them. I used journalistic integrity. I questioned them about the rise of detransitioners. I questioned them about some of the darker side of the trans community, which I think was just trolling and just trying to basically take the piss and just try to turn everyone against me and and just cause a massive shit show. Um, which was uh, really overwhelming. Like I've never been at the center of a culture debate like that before. I've never had it where someone as big as J.K. Rowling is like personally attacking me um, for even something I didn't do. And I think the interview was justified. Like as a journalist, interviewing someone about something that they've done, reporting a massive celebrity to the police is, is fairly normal. It's a fairly standard process. So I just, I found that just a really extreme, unhealthy situation. Um, I've never spoken or gotten involved in the trans debate before. I've always talked about Brexit. On the right, it was immigration, it was culture, but I've never really put my foot in that and didn't realize how fucked up it was until that day. And then India started getting really angry because and tweeting about me because I, I guess, um, misgendered them, which I didn't. And then the trans right activists were coming after me, the JK Rowling fans were coming after me. And it was just like an absolute shit show. And I kind of, I guess this is why no one else really in the journalism sphere gets involved and has a lot of these conversations because of how toxic it's all become. 
Um, and it kind of amalgamated with so much vitriol. I just started losing the plot. Like I couldn't really cope with it. I mean, I was getting messages from family, from school friends who were being DM'd from like Instagram and my Facebook pages, uh, from JK Rowling fans and trans right activists saying just like absolute abuse. Um, and I ended up just calling JK Rowling a cunt because she was, I felt like she was trolling me completely constantly to like breaking point, which is obviously she's not. Um, but I think she knew what she was doing in trying to, like, derail the interview, derail the whole thing, undermine me, byline everyone. And I think it was just, I think it just broke in the end. Um, Why do you think she was doing that? Because it's quite a strong allegation to make against J.K. Rowling. My experience of her uh, statements in public has been that she's quite moderate, actually, given someone who takes way more abuse than even you experienced in that one incident. I don't probably. blame her. Um, I think what she's been through is extreme mm -hmm. and the harassment and her, her entire legacy uh, attempted to be undermined by trans right activists and LGBT people is horrific and undeserved. And it wasn't really until a few days after, um, and obviously I apologized the next day, and then she responded three like really, really gracious responses being like, this was completely like out of nowhere for Kaylin to apologize. I didn't ask for this. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, we all say things we regret. And I realized that she's like, I mean, that was lovely. And I think she's been driven to breaking point actually by all of this stuff from the last few years. And I think when she sees an interview with someone who's basically trying to get them arrested, she's going to go, I think she just flipped and she was just furious and she was just trying to throw it all back. I mean, the, the whole trans debate is so unbelievably vitriolic and toxic. And I would even say more so from the TRA side hmm. that I don't, I guess I don't blame JK Rowling for, for feeling the way she felt and for, and for going after me. Um, and, you know, I've been against like the horrid culture war, um, vitriolic, you know, Twitter behavior for the last few years. I can't stand all of that. I tried to stay out of it. And even I became like that. I became one of those horrible people that night when I tweeted that too, just from being in it for a day. So I can't imagine what she's been mm. going through. But yeah. Um, I'm, I'm guess what I'm curious about is why you think her response was an attempt to undermine the interview and attack <clears> you personally. Because if somebody had done a, a piece about me that had someone come in who's clearly mentally unstable, who'd claimed to have reported me for the to the police for what is clearly not a crime, I'd make fun of that whole thing too. So I guess I'm I, I'm I'm curious that you think this was kind of an attempt to attack you and undermine you. Uh, why why you think that? Well, I think I was just an interviewer asking what has happened in the last twenty four hours. India said she had reported J.K. Rowling to the police, so I didn't have a stake in it. I didn't have an opinion in it. I didn't say, "Oh, that's great! Like, <laughs> let's let's go and watch the arrest." There wasn't there wasn't a piece in it that I had, um, and I've never gone against people like J.K. Rowling in the past. So I think it was uh, I think it was an attempt to basically just shut that whole thing down. She was probably annoyed at me for even speaking to India um, and even giving that person any airtime. Um, and I think I think it was pretty unfair, but I understand why she did it, and I understand the point that she's at of just being absolutely done with all of this. So it's it's difficult. Caitlin, one thing that I find quite bizarre is that you didn't realize how toxic this was. As someone who's yeah. very much <laughs> lived in the online space, you must have been aware, you know, that you were stepping into, you know, the most toxic debate on the internet at the moment. Well, in my entire track record, I've never set foot in that debate. I've never made a comment about it. And I thought as an interviewer at the other side of the table, who's literally just asking questions, that I would have a separation to that. I'm not giving commentary or opinion. So it seemed relatively safe. It might be a little bit spicy. It might mm. be like a news report, but I didn't expect it to be that intense and to have someone with that many followers. And, you know, Elon Musk was liking tweets about me that she was she was putting out. I mean, it was it was all over the place and I didn't expect that. And I didn't expect it to be personal. So, uh, and I don't think I don't think most people would if they were just doing an interview with someone and not passing opinion. Fair enough. So you tweeted what you tweeted. You then apologised. She very graciously accepted. Then what happened? Um, 
Well, I'm basically just done with, I, for the, I've worked for left wing and right wing media for, for like nearly a decade now. Mm -hmm. And it has been, it's been, there's been amazing points. There's been points that have been, uh, made great work and I'm really, really proud of it and added stuff to the world that I think are good films and good pieces of content. But I think it's, it takes its toll massively on someone whose job it is basically to constantly be, be, be responding to what's going on in the news and constantly being on Twitter and constantly, you know, being part of, of debate. And it's gotten extremely toxic recently. So I'm just going to take a break for six months. I'm not going to do any work for six months. And I'm going to probably start my own uh, network, something down the middle, something that isn't left or right or up or down or pro or anti-trans, something right down the middle that people can make up their own minds about. And just going back to making good films, because it's really easy when you're on the internet, if you, even if you're a journalist, this is why so many people get involved in it, to go down rabbit holes and to start chasing clicks and start chasing likes and start following where the drama is and where the attention is. Before you know it, you become the thing that you was the opposite of what you set out to be. And that keeps happening. Uh, and I think the algorithms keep pulling you that way. And I just want to go offline for about six months. I think that's what most people need to do uh, right now as well. Just unplug, <laughs> just no, disappear. No, keep watching, like, and subscribe. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think most people that are really hyper-engaged in Twitter that I know on the left and right still are burnt out, exhausted, becoming more angry and becoming just just vitriolic and, and feeling the same way that I've been feeling about everything. And I think everyone needs to spend more time off, off Twitter. Um, at least for breaks, because it's become it's become one of the most like toxic places I've ever seen. Much more than when I was on the right. Really, I think so. Think As in 2016 to 2018. So I think now think... it's more. I think now it's more extreme. I think I think you know Elon Musk taking over was a good thing because it means that everyone now has the same platform. Everyone now has the same voice. But the media industry has collapsed even more. Journalism has become more crap. Uh, the BBC are no longer in funding actual investigations anymore. They're not doing real journalism anymore. And they're basically leaving the entirety of society to debate and have all these conversations between each other. So I'm, I'm mainly blaming the media for this. It's got nothing really to do with, with, the, with the algorithms. Um, and uh, it's, it's, I think it's just caused everyone to go insane. And it's, it's, not, it's not a healthy environment. I mean, it was a good thing 30 or 40 years ago when we could sit down and get our news from news reporters who you know, gathered information all day, did it on the, did it on the ground, actual old fashioned proper reporting like Panorama used to be, um, and then delivered that news, you'd watch it, you'd get your information, wasn't always perfect, and then you'd go and live the rest of your life with your family and put food on your table. Now it's like, you have to do all of your research yourself, you have to argue with a thousand people on Twitter before you get to a conclusion, and you have to almost throw yourself into a culture war just to get your news from your own news feed. And I feel like it's I think it's just basically broken how we even understand society anymore. It's made people more insane. We don't really know what to believe anymore. Um, and it's an unhealthy place to be. And as somebody who has created content for a long time, have you found yourself being pulled to one direction or another? Because you know that that's going to generate more views. You know that it's going to generate more revenue, etc. I try more so on the right. I was creating more outrageous content for views. It wasn't really about money. We, I mean, I was always working for people with a set salary that was very small. So it didn't matter if they got more or less views, I would always get the same amount of money. But there is an excitement, I think, naturally to, to, to generate more clicks and to do something that more people see. It, feels, it makes you feel like you have more of an impact. So a lot of the time, you know, when I was working with Tommy Robinson, we would, our content would become more leveled up. Um, because well, we knew that it would get more more clicks. It wasn't the case with you know when I was working with Lauren Southern or people can I, like that. Can I just pause you there? You say more leveled up. What does that mean? Well, when you're writing scripts and talking about Islam, it would be you know we would just use rhetoric that would become a little bit more outrageous because I guess I knew it would you know more people would watch it and then we'd have more of an impact and then we'd have more success with our message. You know, it wasn't this completely insidious thing. It was just that's almost the marketing tool you have to use to become more successful and to, to, um, and to, to have a bigger audience and then to, to get your message out. Um, mostly though, I mean, the work that I was most proud of, you know, was, was things like with, you know, with Farmlands or with, with some of those documentaries that were considered that took a long time that were actually adding something to, to public debate. The film I made in Ukraine that actually added to public debate, serious considered things. But those, 
those are great, but over time, the longer you spend on Twitter, I, it naturally, I think, you just get drawn drawn down more of kind of extreme rabbit holes. I mean, this is why no one's really doing real journalism anymore as well, I don't think. I think this is why everyone's atomizing and going independent. It's why, you know, Megyn Kelly has a, a commentary show now instead of doing the original journalism she used to do. I think it's why everyone's splitting off and breaking off from their networks because they're saying more and more outrageous things like, you know, Candace Owens, all these other people. I think it's atomizing everyone and causing everyone to be on a rat race, to be the leader of who can say the most outrageous extreme things, to get the most engagement so that they can have the biggest message. It doesn't necessarily mean it's always a bad thing, because having more reach is, is good for everyone. But the mental health impact, I think, is devastating. And I think it can just break people. It can cause them to become horrible. And I it felt can. like that myself. It definitely can. What's interesting to me is I think there's a big role for personal responsibility in all of this, because... 20 years ago, if you put more outrageous things in the newspaper headline, it would also sell more newspapers. But there would have been somebody in their editorial team who would have said, no, no, we can't do this. And I, I certainly don't feel that we've become more extreme over time. I've become much more measured in what I post on Twitter over time and how I consume Twitter as well. So I think there's, there's a big role for your own thing. But I, I want to take you back to your conversation with India because... You say you just did an interview, which I, from one perspective is true, but I think the very nature of the trans discussion is such that it's actually very difficult to do an interview with somebody without at least to some people taking a position. For example, I, 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 you said you didn't call India him, but I, th I thought I saw a video that you did in, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, I'm, I'm happy to be corrected. But throughout this conversation, you've called India them, mm. which is to me, no offense to you personally, but just as a position is even more ridiculous than <laughs> because India is not a them. There isn't there. There is no them. Right. Do you see what I mean? Well, I'm so. Not... So sorry, just to finish the point. So by doing an interview with somebody that you then defend on that basis or whether you talk about India as a them later, you have already made yourself part of the of the way the conversation is being had. No, I think if, uh, t calling India a she is taking one side of the culture yeah. war and calling India him is taking one side of the culture war. Yeah. Calling India them is basically not referring to them as either of those things. Them isn't a thing. It's basically just a neutral term, which I think is the way to, I think is the most neutral way that you can, you can come at it. That's interesting. So, <laughs> well, the most neutral thing I think yeah. it's the most neutral way that you can come mm. you can come about it. Like, well, yes, but it's kind of like what well, look, uh, obviously people might disagree with this, but it's kind of like saying, you know, uh, it's like what the BBC said BBC said, well, we're not calling Hamas terrorists because we were trying to be neutral. Mm. There is a truth that that you have to acknowledge. Like India is male. So India was born male. India identifies as another gender now. I, I might not agree. You might not agree with what those things are. So them is just, it's an abstract term, and then it takes away the whole gender Yeah, I don't issue. think it does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also, Hamas, also Hamas are terrorists. Right, like they and India are. is male. So, so the, India was, was born male. But still is male. You can't change whether you're male or not. Well, this is what's difficult. Like, is it, is it an aggressive, is it a rude, is it, is it, is it a mean thing to, to call someone who looks like a woman a male. I mean, I don't think it's, you know, when Blair White was being interviewed by Candace Owens on Dave Rubin's show, and Candace kept saying, you're a man, I thought that was horrible. Blair clearly looks like a woman. And I don't, and I think even, even if India doesn't look quite the same as Blair, it means that it's okay to, to just call but them But I'm man. not saying you're a man to India's face. I'm just saying when you talk about India in our conversation, to many people, you being unwilling to effectively be honest about what the truth is, will be seen as taking a position. Well, I think, I think removing myself, because I'm supposed to be a journalist in this, removing myself from that whole debate is saying they are they and they are them, because that, that's not the non-binary thing. That's just referring to them as yeah. if I said India instead of them. And it just takes it away because that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to get involved in the culture war. If I said she, the right, ruling people would be annoyed. If I said him, then the trans right activists would be annoyed. And that's not the debate that I'm trying to get into. Mm. So I think it's the, I think it's the neutral proper way to, to talk about I would argue your experience demonstrates otherwise, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. You know. <laughs> we'll be back with our guests in a minute, but first. 
Last year, I was introduced to Monetary Metals, a game-changing platform that offers a unique approach to saving and earning income. And I have to say, I've been so impressed that I'm really enjoying using my Monetary Metals account. If you listen closely to our interview with world-renowned economist Jim Rickards last year, you'll have heard him say this. Gold will be where countries go and it should be where investors go. Uh, follow the money, as they say. And central banks have been net buyers for the last 13 years. So they're about the best informed players you can imagine. So I'd have some gold. So we know about the benefits of owning gold. What you may not know is that now there's a way to earn a yield on your gold paid in more gold. Why keep saving in fiat currency, which loses value every year due to inflation, when you can save and earn in gold and silver? What's more, imagine not only being able to protect your savings against inflation, but also earning passive income from it. With monetary metals, you can do just that. Right now, you can earn between 2 to 5% annually on gold, paid in gold, when you open an account with them. If you're an accredited investor, you're eligible to earn even higher returns. We're talking about actually earning interest on gold paid in more gold. So if you had 100 ounces and the interest rate is 5% annually with monetary metals, that means you're going to earn five additional ounces of gold every year. So if you're looking to protect and grow your wealth, look no further than Monetary Metals. Visit monetary-metals.com slash trigonometry or scan the QR code below. To learn more and get started, go to monetary-metals.com slash trigonometry. And now, back to the interview. L listening to, to your experience, on the one hand, I go, this is absolute insanity. What, how, where we've come to as a society, that we're sitting down and having this conversation. On the other hand, I'm going, well, you know, what did you expect in a, in a way? And what does that really say about society and journalism that this is the hottest topic? If you're looking around at our society, you're looking at wars breaking out. You're looking at people struggling to afford the basics of life, the housing crisis, whatever it may be political system not being fit for purpose. What do you think is so incredibly toxic about this issue? Well, mo well a lot of, uh, generally, politics has become more toxic just all across the board. Even if you're talking about Ukraine, then you get called, you know, it's all called a proxy war or you're called anti-Putin, you know, and that, that's become completely toxic. You can't talk about Palestine or Israel anymore without death threats. You can't talk about almost any subject. This is just slightly hotter than that because we're very bougie in, in Britain and we like to talk about local issues and things that are that are easy and that's what journalism is focusing on. But um, I mean, I get told by so many people, well, why? what did you expect? Why did you just not have this conversation? Why did you just not get involved in this? Why did you just not cover this story? And I'm like, well, maybe that's also one of the reasons that it's so difficult to talk about and it's so bad because people just expect you not to get into it and not to talk about it and not to, and, and to have it as an issue that we that we ignore. Um, and I think that's unhealthy as well. But generally, everything has become more fucked. Working on the left and the right and seeing all of the, all of the different um, dynamics and all of the different subjects, it's become almost impossible to discuss anything on Twitter anymore. Um, because we've all just, we've all, we all just hate each other now. You know, people um, are not actually that horrible in real life. You know, people on the mm -hmm. left who I've worked with recently who are really high profile figures, can be absolutely lovely and loyal behind the scenes who I'll probably have friends for the rest of my life. And it's the same with people on the right. But as soon as they get their phone out, they become completely different people mm -hmm. and they become incapable of even seeing the other side as human beings, seeing the other side as, 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 as normal. So it's even when I left the right and started working on the center left, there were so many people that would say, you should never have. You should never have left. You know. You should never work again. Who would make massive complaints that I should never be able to be employed again? Never mind make news again on those on those spectrums because they don't see people who engage in debates about things like immigration or free speech as human beings who should be allowed to even exist or work anymore. And that's completely fucked too. So um, it's it's just been uh, completely devastating to see. It looks like the kind of decline of civilization and society through the internet. And um, I, I don't think it's going to get any better, but the trans debate, again, it's no better than the Palestine-Israel debate. It's no different to the Ukraine-Russia um, debate. I think it is different for the reasons that we just tried to discuss, which is the problem, the reason the trans debate is so toxic is it's, it's kind of indicative of a broader thing where we've become a society that prioritizes um, B 
being nice over being honest. Uh, and so the them, the them, that's why I picked up on this, right? It's like uh, we had India on the show and we were very respectful and welcoming and blah, blah, blah. But it doesn't change biological reality. I'm happy to call India, India, right? But I guess what I'm saying is I think it's very different because at the core of it, there is an unwillingness to be honest about a truth in order to be nice, which is not the case with Israel and Palestine. It's just a tribal conflict. It's not the case with Ukraine and Russia. It's just a international conflict, etc. But on this issue, I think the reason it has become as as prominent as it has is you have, you know, leading politicians, Keir Starmer at some point, you know, not knowing what a woman is and all this other stuff. And a lot of people just see that as dishonesty. Yeah, I mean, also Britain is a unique, in a, also in Britain, like, we have a value system that is to be overly polite, like we're ridiculed of it yeah. across the world. That is yeah. kind of what it is to be British. Yeah. So I think there should be a bit of a balance between being nice and being honest. Otherwise, we're just going to be, you know, brutally honest and horrible to each other all the time. There's a lot of Eastern Bloc countries which uh, are a bit like that, and it's kind of unpleasant as a culture. So I think it's a good thing in your society, and your culture, to be a bit polite. That yeah. doesn't mean you deny facts and reality completely. Mm. Right. I think calling someone them is polite, and I don't think it hurts anyone. I think it's fine. I don't think it increases or decreases the culture war anymore. I think that's a nice British thing, just to be polite. But I don't know. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, you, you talk about that all the time with you know politeness and honesty. Mm -hmm. But surely, you know, you, you acknowledge one of the great values about Britain is is that we're you I, know polite. completely. Uh, but I think the reason the trans issue is a little bit different is that the downstream con and this is it took me a little while to truly get this as well. So I didn't necessarily start in this position. But with the trans issue, the difference is that by being initially polite, you then have a bunch of downstream consequences because you are not able to talk about people's sex properly. If you if you say this person identifies as a woman and wants to dress as a woman and have a feminine name and whatever, but is male, that's fine. Because when it comes to single sex spaces, when it comes to female sports, etc., you go, well, we accept India's right to be whatever India wants to be, except in these situations where India is still male. You see what I mean? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's kind of, you can also draw a line. This is like what people used to say about gay marriage. Once we allow gay marriage, then we'll be allowing people to have sex with That's animals. Not what it's, like, so it's like, once we allow one thing, then the rest is going to go. That's once we're polite to trans people, then it will become no, more. No, no, sorry. Just to be clear, so that we were talking about the same thing. I'm not saying if we call India a woman, then at some point later down the line, things will get even worse. What I'm saying is the logical consequence in the present moment of not acknowledging that India is male is India is then entitled to do things that India shouldn't be entitled to do. Well, that's it, right now, like go into a female space, like participate in female sports, etc. Right. So it's not about if we allow gay marriage, then things will get even worse. Yeah. It's more like if we refuse to be honest about the truth now, you're going to get Adam Graham pretend that he's Isla Graham or Isla Bryson and end up in a female prison with a penis having raped two women. That's, that's a good point. Actually, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. issue. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is also why I probably shouldn't really have gotten into this. Um, <laughs> because, because you know far more about this than I do. And yeah. I've never really researched it. This was just an interesting story. And I just yeah. wanted to get that perspective. And thought saying then was, a, was, a, was an all right thing to do. I think it's why I'm so sad about this whole situation because I didn't have like a bad intention. Um, but yeah, I mean, why I don't think you had a bad intention. I'm just saying I don't think it's possible to have these conversations and fudge on certain things because you're just not, you're not going to get anywhere. So you think I should have called India a man in the response? No, I, there's, I, I actually, if you want to be tactical about it, what I would have just said is India, 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 instead of them, them, them. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know? fair enough. Yeah. That, that's how you might play it in that situation next time. But, but my point more broadly is I just think this issue in particular is as contentious as it is because there's some really key things that are being debated under the pretense of talking about the trans mm -hmm. issue. And one of them is, are we allowed to be truthful to prevent harm if it hurts someone's feelings? And my view after some consideration is, yes, we should be able to be honest, even if some people get upset by it. Yeah. And, and it's also as well, then you bring in the whole kids element of it, you know, mm -hmm. kids of a certain age, 9, 10, 11, begin given puberty blockers when the reality is they can't possibly consent to that form of medical intervention. So what eventually happens with this issue is that people who aren't as aware of 
every facet of it, because it is kind of like an iceberg issue. On the surface of it, you go, well, we're just talking about pronouns, aren't we? But there's everything else below. And the moment people then walk into this particular minefield, they tread on something and they don't even actually know what's happened or why something has blown up. Yeah, it's true. But I think I think generally it's, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. It's something I guess I still don't know that much about. Yeah. Um, but I, I can see how that would work. But it's also why I haven't really discussed this ever really on a show before or done any work about it because it's extremely complicated and I just don't know, you know, it's not my area of, of what I've ever, you know, studied or talked about. But... Um, the other reason that the bio, uh, that this may have happened as well is I think it's the publication that you worked for, which mm. is I'm keen to get back to, which will be perceived by many people as being kind of far left, certainly the publication side of it. And so when a, a that publication does a piece with India Willoughby, people are going to put those two, two and two mm. together and then they're probably not going to give you the benefit of the doubt of this is a neutral interviewer trying to have that conversation. So I guess the question is you're now leaving the byline times. Why is that? Well, no, I'm 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 basically going to just take a step back for six months because I've spent far too long on the internet, far too yeah. long on Twitter, and yeah. far too long with these things. And I'm probably going to go and start another network. But for six months, I don't know for sure what's going to happen. But I just want to uh, get off get off the internet because I'm going to go completely insane, like uh, like a lot of my friends and colleagues. Uh, well, I know you can't talk about everything because yeah. you you ended up signing an NDA. I'm just curious, to some extent, what it is that caused you to leave. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> without getting yeah, you in trouble, yeah, without yeah. getting you in trouble, I'm just yeah. curious. Well, I mean, it's, what, it's what you can say. I think it's just that I became the thing that um, you know. This was a mutual decision. I became the thing that I hate, which is which is a, which is someone that was at the depths of the of the culture war floor on the internet mm. that called a really high profile, um, you know, one of the most successful children's author in the world, a, a, a cunt, and and just can't and, and I just you know can't continue to. You know, do professional content and be and be like a serious. I, I don't know. I, it's I not can't, a good look. No. It's not a good look. But it's also just embarrassing, and it's not who I actually like am and, and have been for the last few years. Mm -hmm. I focused on making great films and great content and actually trying to add something to the public discourse. And through being involved in this stuff, even for forty eight hours, became the thing that I've criticized for years, and became the thing about you know uh, internet radicalization, rabbit holes, mm -hmm. becoming crazy. Became that again. It has just made me want to just you know take a step back again for six months and, and reset. But it's extremely um, yeah, it's extremely draining. It's difficult. Do you I'm, think? Oh, sorry. sorry, go for it. Can I just finish yeah, yeah, on one, yeah, one yeah, thing? Go for just it, yeah. one thing on this because I'm uh, so I, I totally get all that. And people, everybody makes mistakes. Mm -hmm. Everybody. What I'm what I was curious about is sitting mm -hmm. in this chair only a few months ago was Lawrence Fox, mm -hmm. who said that he wouldn't shag a female journalist, and. I wonder if he had called that journalist a putrid cunt, whether the response would have been as measured and mild as actually it has been with you. You've been on both left and right in the media. And I'm, I just, I wonder, look, I, I, what, what Lawrence said, you know, we talked with him about it and I think he was actually not necessarily all that happy with the way we conducted that interview. I thought we were fair mm -hmm. because I did think that what he said was, I mean, what you said was way worse. Yeah. Uh, but what he said was also uh, out of line. But I guess my question is, do you think that if Lawrence Fox had said that, he would have been treated the same as you've been treated? You, do, I, do you see what I'm getting at? Do people on different sides of politics who make broadly similar kinds of transgressions mm. get treated equally? No, I think it is seen on the left on Twitter as okay to call J.K. Rowling a cop because we don't see people as human beings on the other side of our politics anymore. Right-wingers do exactly the same thing to people on the left, which is why they think they're all pedos and they should be thrown in jail. They don't see them as human beings. And people on the left don't see people like J.K. Rowling as human beings in a lot of ways as well. So when I made that comment, which I don't mean, and I actually yeah. always liked J.K. Rowling, um, the, um, uh, the fact that I have been, even in the last couple of weeks, at events I've been to or events that are left-wing, told, oh, you shouldn't have deleted it, you were right anyway, you know, you're know, you on the side, was sad. Because I shouldn't have said that. So people, not... people were saying to you, you were right to call her that. Yeah, people on the wow. left. Um, because that's what they think. They don't see people like JK Rowling as human beings because we don't see anyone on the other side of our politics as human beings anymore because of the atomization of things like Twitter and because of the way that we converse in our politics anymore. And that's, that's the most sad thing. Um, and I didn't really know it was that bad until I tweeted that. Um, 
but it's horrible. But it's the future of our politics. This is how we're all going to start conversing and seeing each other. Not necessarily this show and you guys. You've been doing this for a long time in a, mm -hmm. in a measured and proper way. You haven't been chasing likes and clicks, but most commentators do. And that's why I think people are, people are breaking down. That's why we're probably headed for something like Civil War one day, because we don't see anyone else as human beings who don't have the same politics as us anymore. Caleb, I find that the fact that the people on the left would come up to you and you know metaphorically slap you on the back for that tweet, when the left always talk about patriarchy, misogyny, and you're a man who called, and oh, look, you apologize, fine, but you're a man who called a woman a cunt, and that's incredible. There's going to be so many bleeps in this interview. <laughs> yeah, it is. Because <laughs> we want that YouTube advertising money, yeah, thank you very much. Exactly, and it sounds, <laughs> It sounds better when I say it, let's be fair. The accent, it gives it a little je ne sais quoi. But that's deeply misogynistic. Yeah, because it, because it isn't about misogyny. It isn't about who's right and who's wrong. It's about us versus them. Right. And it's about, it's about us being divided and the good side and the evil side. And that's all we see each other as. It doesn't matter whether it's actually misogynistic or not. Um, there are countless examples of stuff like this I saw on the right with hypocrisy as well. There's also a like cult... what? Give us give yeah. us some examples. Well, I mean, it's you know we talk about um, right wingers talk about grooming gangs being one of the central problems in Britain, but there's a huge problem with sexual abuse and sexual assault being tolerated with figures on the right, and that's very well known by a lot of which by... figures. Well, <laughs> there's well there's a lot of members of the EDL who are who are convicted who are who are who are um, who are all doing this stuff who mm. had all their names and stuff published who didn't really have any backlash from. From those groups, and then there are figures now who are very high profile, who are some of the most high profile people in the world who have been, uh, who have been engaged in that stuff, uh, who who see it as absolutely uh, fine, and who's who's you know the right basically have a tolerance for that stuff. Um, and I have to be honest with you, we've had lots of people who are left and right of center, and I obviously know lots of people. We both do in those circles. I have no idea what you're talking about, genuinely. Yeah, you know, I mean, I can't go into this because there's an active court case with these things. But look, there is also a culture of language of people like, say, like people like Andrew Tate on, yeah. on the right, who are. I don't super... know if Andrew Tate is on the right. I, I, I don't know if he's political. I just, well, maybe you know more. I don't know. Well, I think Andrew Tate is seen as a right wing figure, um, 100%, uh, who has said hugely misogynistic things on his TikTok about yeah. women and treating yeah. women badly. Um, but then who will also talk about grooming gangs being the biggest problem in the UK or, you know, how Islam is, you know, then his 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 um, colleagues and people like that will talk about how you know Islam is terrible because it's uh, misogynistic and hates women and, and hates gays when they're doing the same thing. So there's a lot of hypocrisy. But again, it's not about us. It's not about you know um, misogyny or not misogyny. It's about you know my side versus your side and good versus evil and tribalism. So that's why I think that's why that stuff is happening with J.K. Rowling. It's also the fact that you know we can't. You know we we want to talk about how great it is to celebrate women in, in power and powerful mm -hmm. women. But a lot of people on the left want to tear down the most successful children's book author, you know, one of the first female billionaires, um, for, because she said a few things they don't like. And that's, you know, hypocritical as well. So this, it's, 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 again, I don't really think any of this is really about politics. It's just about tribalism and hating people on the other side, because that's what gets clicks. And that's who we've been, you know, taught to hate. Do you think, how much of this do you think is people's beliefs? How much of this do you think is outright cynicism? going for the clicks, and how much of this is people being manipulated, in a sense, by the algorithms, by their experience online, to see people who disagree with them in that way? Well, I, the, the people who propagate a lot of this stuff, I think, are driven by li uh, clicks and likes, and you know, they'll, they'll say anything that will generate attention, and usually replies to tweets get far more traction than, than a tweet itself, which incentivizes and encourages arguments and, and takedowns and it's why everyone who writes a tweet, there's a one under it saying the opposite. It's about encouraging people to, to, to constantly, constantly be pissed off and angry and, and argue with people. So I think a huge amount of it is that. Um, but the second amount is it's our news feeds are entirely different from each other's now. Mm. And we consume 300 foot of newsfeed every day, which you printed out, it'd be the length of a football stadium. And that's how we form our entire world opinion. We don't read newspapers, watch television anymore. And that newsfeed is curated based on the political opinions that you already have, or they're driven to more extreme versions of those, and that is how you perceive the world. And that is usually giving you only one version of an event in which there are two sides. And that will drive you more and more and more to see the other side as an enemy, to hate them more, whether you're on the left or the right. And it incentivizes that tribalism, uh, because it's very 
monetizable as well. I mean, this is how these, these social media sites are, are designed and driven to be profit based and to keep you on there for as long as possible. And a lot of the time, it's not people's fault. They're scrolling through their feed. They think that they're looking at the real world. They think that they're looking at news stories, but they're seeing one more extreme version of an event mm -hmm. and not believing the other thing happened. Um, you know, it's even like when, when these kind of hate crime statistics would come out, you know, in 2016 and 2017, I would read constant reports on my feed that would talk about hate crime hoax here, the big hate crime hoax in America with that Muslim girl with the hijab that was faked. And it was all about fake hate, uh, hate crimes happening. Uh, and I went on my friend's news feed on Twitter around the same time, and it was talking about the rise in hate crimes and how it's become an epidemic and how since Brexit it's going through the roof. And the two news feeds basically contrasted to one that said they didn't exist, they were all hoaxes, and one that said it was becoming an epidemic. Those two things are the reasons that we just don't understand basically reality anymore and can't stand, you know, the other side. Because, you know, if, if I said, you know, hate crimes aren't on the rise, people would think I'm an absolute monster, you know, supremacist or whatever. But I would think that because my newsfeed told me that. So it's, it's hard. So how did you make that transition from moving right to left? Because you work with some pretty major figures on the right. You worked with Tommy Robinson, Lauren Southern. You did a bit of work for um, Alex Jones. Yeah. I mean, that's, a, and then moving to Byline Times, that's that's a hell of a gear change, isn't it? <laughs> well, kind of. If you look at everything I've said publicly in the last four years, I haven't said anything that is left wing. You know, I haven't said a left wing opinion. You know, I haven't said anything about the trans debate on the, on the left or right. I've said Brexit's bad because it's damaged Britain because I saw that in the Steelworks and News Reports. I did a lot of work in Ukraine talking about war crimes, but it wasn't really going on the left. Byline Times, as far as I can see it, I don't think, I know you disagree, is a hard left newspaper. It's one of the only newspapers that exist in Britain that are funding original investigative reporting. They exposed the PPE scandal, they exposed a huge amount of corruption uh, in the government, and they also facilitated me to be able to travel across the UK and do on the ground independent journalism across Europe, actually. Yeah. And, and at a time where we're not doing that anymore. So I, I, I saw that outlet as, a, as probably a solution to the stuff that I was seeing on the right, which was one-sided commentary and no original reporting. I saw a newspaper that's actually funding real investigative journalism, and I thought it was a great place to go, which it was. I'm really proud of my work with Byline. So obviously I had the TV, set up the TV, so that was a separate wing of it. I wasn't closely involved in, in the paper and their editorial and their investigations, but I carried out you know, I used, to, I used to get a notepad and go out and find original stories when the stuff was happening with farming and trade deals in this country. I'd get into a car and drive all the way up to Northumberland and find farms, knock on their doors, ask them how they've been impacted, and then do reports and come back to London with them. And they would do really, really well. Because my work on the right, as much as, you know, it was it was very, very successful and it was getting a lot of clicks, it wasn't adding anything to um, to actual culture. I don't think it was adding anything to to to, uh, I don't think it was doing anything really helpful or anything really good. It was just propagating right-wing opinions. And I thought going on the left and doing the same thing would be just doing the, you know, would be doing the same kind of damage. No one actually gets anywhere from it. It's splitting society just as much in the same way. So that's why all my work has been investigative journalism for the last four years. The problem was getting involved for 10 seconds in, in the trans debate. But the reason I was on the right was because you know, in 2016, everything was on fire. Europe was on fire. Everything was burning. There was terrorist attacks every five minutes. You had um, Charlie Hebdo. You had the newspapers being shot up. And no one was talking about it in the media. You had the Orlando shooting where 50 gay people were killed by a Muslim extremist. And then you had Owen Jones ha being the only person they really brought on to discuss it and say it had nothing to do with Islam. They didn't look at the ideology behind it. They didn't look at the, the, the reason it was, it was happening. They didn't look at the Quran. Not like when Christchurch happened and they broke down the entire ideology of the white supremacist tutor and, and took action against that. And I felt like there was a gap in the media that needed to be filled with people having these conversations and discussing them. So that's when I wrote to Rebel and I got a job as a presenter there. And I was, I, you know, I was at the beginning doing pretty good work. It was about free speech, why we're not having these conversations. It was talking about Islam, but it was pretty moderate and it was genuinely something I thought was really, really good. But over time, there is an incentive to create stuff that is more outrageous. Within the rebel model, there was that system, which is why I left. And then I guess I became a bit of a victim of it too, working with those people, of, of just making stuff for the sake of being controversial. And at the end of it, it wasn't what I had set out to do originally, which was to fill a gap of having real conversations. It was just putting out right-wing propaganda. And that's kind of how a lot of those people operate. We'll get you back to the interview in a minute, but first. 
That, my friends, is the sound of another sale on Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. I know that building a business takes work. Look at my face, I'm exhausted. But the lovely thing about Shopify is that no matter how big you wanna grow, Shopify is with you every step of the way. Shopify is a commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Whether you're selling handmade jewelry, art prints, or podcast merch like us, buy our merch, Shopify simplifies selling online and in person so you can successfully grow your business. Shopify even gets you selling across social media marketplaces like Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. TikTok just makes me angry, I'm too old. So, if you're ready to get serious about selling, sign up for a one pound per month trial period at shopify.co.uk slash trigger. Go to shopify.co.uk slash trigger. And one more time for luck, that's shopify.co.uk slash trigger. And now, back to the interview. So that's why I left a lot of that. I mean, there are other reasons. Also, it's 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 extremely chaotic. There's a huge amount of backstabbing. That's why they're still all falling out with each other even to this day. Sounds like uh, the left, mate, to be honest yeah, with you. Yeah, no, but it's like, well, I mean, the left is a little bit more organized. But I mean, what? it was what? <laughs> well, it's a bit more sensible. I mean, you know, you don't have the same chaos on the left than you do on, on the right right now with, you know, with the Daily Wire falling apart with... Daily Wire's not falling apart. They just got rid of Candace yeah, Owens. Yeah, and look what's happening with, you know, Stephen Crowder and Jared. And that lawsuit all in the same week. I mean, that is not happening on, on the left on, on that same level. It's interesting because we have a running joke whenever we have a left wing <laughs> guest. Uh, we always say to the guys, don't, if they're running late, setting up, we're like, don't worry, he's on the left, he's not going to be on time. Well, I'm not on the left, but. <laughs> <laughs> but you were late. Uh, but it's interesting. I mean, our experience with left wing people, which was our industry in yeah. comedy, uh, is they're far less organized than people on the right. But anyway, uh, so. I, so I, it sounds like to me that actually many of the reasons that you were attracted to the right wing space still are valid in your mind. And that's kind of you still think those things are important. Yeah, I mean, the the questions are still valid. Why didn't the media cover this stuff? We still have a, a complete lack of, of of courage to be able to have any of the conversations that you have on this show, which is why this is so successful. And BBC is failing because you're having the conversations that people need and want to hear for society to continue to develop. Um, but the answers to those aren't making videos uh, in no-go zones with Tommy Robinson in Rome. They are having these conversations like this. And I think just because the solutions I found were wrong doesn't mean that the questions um, were wrong. I still think those questions are valid. Um, I've always said that. Um, it's just... And yeah. just so that people understand why isn't doing a video in a no-go zone, why isn't that part of the answer? To show people what's happening on the ground, if 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 it's an accurate. Well, I think it's if it's with if it's with a commentator who is doesn't have an interest in showing exactly what's going on and is there with an incentment to cause chaos, then it's probably not the most healthy way to do it. You know? Yeah. So can, can you? Sorry. Yeah. Go I'm not sure. I do know. Just can you explain that a little bit more? Like, what do you mean? Well, I think, I think going to a, uh, a lot of the time my reporting with people on the right was already decided what, what would happen and then we would go and cover it just to fill an agenda, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that wasn't, again, for nefarious, sinister reasons. It was because we knew that would get views and then we would be able to become more influential to have these conversations. But yeah, that, that's, that's just not a healthy way to do it, to start with, with your answer and to, and to work backwards to, to go and film it. And we know if you know if you're going to go to an area and you know it's going to erupt, or you know it's going to kick off, or you know whatever's going to happen, and then you film that and act really shocked. I just don't think that's a healthy way to you know make news. Um, yeah. So the the other way to do it is where you go there and you don't have an agenda and you just report on what you see, which is what I did with Byline for the last four years. That's why that's why I left the right and tried to do content and investigative journalism where I would arrive in a country like in Kiev last year. I arrived there and I had no agenda. I didn't know how extreme the war was, and I didn't really know what was going on. I wasn't covering Ukraine at all, but I ended up staying there for three months, going all the way to the front line and spending months figuring out and speaking to villagers, understanding if they actually wanted to be part of Russia or not, going down to her son, actually figuring out what's going on for myself and developing a film um, with no agenda at the beginning. And that's, that's, I think that's something that I've transitioned to. It's not from the left, right to the left, really. It's from making stuff with an agenda to making stuff without an agenda. 
Um, and just because Byline Times is perceived as being a left-wing newspaper doesn't take away from the fact that it still allowed me to do actual investigative journalism, which I think is important. Oh, yeah, I completely. think you, you, I'm just hearing between the lines that you think that like thinking that something is a left-wing newspaper is like a criticism. The new left-wing newspapers are allowed to exist and a part, a very important part of the ecosystem because left and right will naturally focus on different issues. And some of the issues the left will focus on are also very important, um, as long as they're being covered accurately and fairly, which, as I think we'd both agree, we'd both agree hasn't always been the case yeah. with left and right. Yeah. So going back to the investigative journalism bit, one of the threads that I'm noticing more and more, and we've talked about a lot of journalism with this, it's actually really worrying that investigative journalism seems to be on the way out when it's much needed in society because it holds powerful figures to account. Yeah, it shocked me how successful my neutral reports were when I started with, uh, with the TV. Like mm -hmm. literally just going to a town, going to a farm, going to a steelworks that was closing down or the Honda factory that closed down in Swindon and just asking workers why it had happened or what the reasons were and getting their perspective and then putting it out would get millions of views. And then I would hear the next day that, you know, Lewis Goodall or, or someone from the BBC had gone and tried to find them and ask them for an interview because these institutions are no longer getting in a car getting a notepad out and doing actual work. A, because it's expensive and these companies want to save money. They have boards all across, you know, Channel 4 and ITV, whose entire purpose is to cut costs as much as possible. And in that, they lose. The first thing to go is always investigative reporting. And that's why we're not seeing actual trusted stuff come out of these news organizations any anymore. There's been a new hiring process that is getting rid of their old reporters and replacing them with political influencers for their TikTok account so they can drive engagement, which is only going to make this worse. Newsnight, as part of their cuts last year, cut their investigative department as well, which was literally the point of Newsnight. They're just going to mm. be a debate show now. Mm. And that leaves a huge void in Britain that we have of what the hell is going on, especially outside news studios in London. Like, I remember going to, um, when I went to Port Talbot, the Steelworks, my report there got something like four or five million views, and it was why the plant closed down. And I just spent two nights there speaking to steel workers, speaking to, 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 to some of the key leaders. No one in the news really understood why it was closing down. They went there for two seconds and left, or they did it from London. And I asked all these people who gave me these really profound answers, have the news reached out to you? Have you been asked for an interview? And none of them said, yeah. Even the First Minister of Wales said he hadn't been reached out to. And that report was, I think, really successful because people in this country want original investigative on the ground reporting and they're not getting it from their televisions anymore. Um, and and it's, it's, it's really, really sad because the point of the media is to give us that so that we can, um, we can understand what's going on in our own country, which we don't. Um, I think that's what I've been most proud of is that work. Whatever I do next, whether it's uh, with, you know, Byline again or whatever it is, it'll be that. Because even though it's expensive, it's invaluable and it's fulfilling as well. You're actually finding out something that's true and then putting it out in the world that people didn't know about. And, and if it's popular, as, as it can be, then the, you will generate the revenue that you need to actually keep doing it as well. Yeah, you don't actually need to be, I didn't realize this after all, you don't actually need to be outrageous or extreme yeah. or just say crazy stuff to get clicks. You can actually produce really, really high quality, good work. And people want that just as much. Um, I think people healthy. now want it more, which is why we've always taken that approach. And um, I, I understand, look, it's true what you say, people always respond to incentives. Um, but the, the incentives are not always clear. There was a moment when, you know, there is a short term incentive to be outrageous and get clicks. But what I think we've observed in the six, mm. six years we've been doing this is most of the people who do that, they rise quickly and then they fall quickly. Yeah. Whereas if you're true to core principles, which is trying to get to the truth, w wherever it goes, then people will over time actually see that. And even if they don't agree with every individual interview you've done or bit of reporting you've done, they'll know that you are trying to get to the truth and they'll respect it more. And then they'll watch it, even if it's not necessarily the thing that panders perfectly to their particular opinion. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of how the world works. If you put something of quality out enough times and something that's actually valuable that yeah. you've considered, it will reward you and the, and the world will, you know, be able to feel its value. So that's, that's all really important. But it's also why so many commentators on the right and the left who are really outrageous and who do say inflammatory things usually only last about two years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then it's and then it's over. It's because really all they have is outrage and they're not saying anything of substance. So once they've delivered that whatever it is outrageous comment, 
fine. You can keep doing it again and again, but it's almost like a drug hit. Then you're going to need to get more and more outrageous. Yeah. And then that's, and then they get into problems. But also, yeah. I really feel that people now are craving things that are more substantive. Constantin did this amazing series where he just went out and talked to people at Israel and Palestine. That was great. Protests. And he asked apolitical questions to protesters and they gave his response. And it was fascinating to watch because yeah. you're there, you're there seeing this piece of content, and part of you is going, This is really interesting. And the other part of you is going, I haven't seen something like this in 20 years. Yeah. No, I had exactly the same thought with that. I was even looking at like who <clears throat> shot it, who I was just fascinated with the whole crew, everything, everything about how you did it, because it was completely original. And it was similar to the work that we that I've been doing. Um, but no one's doing it because A, people are very lazy. No, you can just do a show behind your computer screen. B, it's expensive. But C, it's 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 hard. It's actually hard work. It's it's scary. You, know, you have to go into crowds. It's a diff it's a difficult thing to do. But the no, when it does happen, it does happen properly. It will cut through. It will cut through culture completely. Um, yeah, which is very important. No, and it's great. And I I think uh, the the main thing is to. I hear a lot of kind of disempowerment in the way you talk about social media, and I'm just always wary of having that approach because I think ultimately we're all responsible for, yes, Twitter can drive you to the extremes, but it doesn't have to. Like, I played around with that dunking on people thing and all of that for a while, and then I was like, no, I don't like doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd much rather get 100,000 new subscribers by doing a speech that goes viral than I would by dunking on India Willoughby or J.K. Rowling. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but you're, I think you're very unique in that. You're also smarter than most people, I would say. Most people are kind of passive and they're not engaged in this all the time mm -hmm. and they just want to get their news for an hour mm -hmm. before dinner time and then they need to go to bed. They don't have the time and capacity, I think, to think through the processes like that. I think they're, they're consumers of a, of, of a news feed mm -hmm. that determines their, their, their world opinion and they don't have the time and capacity to go beyond that or to even think beyond that. Um, which is why, which is why everything is becoming more radical. It's why when you go to those protests and you speak to those protesters and you say, "Well, what do you think about Hamas?" and they have no idea that they're even, you know, they have right wing views because they've never seen that on their feeds and they become radicalized yeah. to the left. It's universal. It's 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 everywhere. It's why Christmas dinner parties are now basically ruined because no one can talk to each other, other grandparents. Um, um, and but the solution to it is that kind of work, and I think is the kind of work I've been doing for the last few years but for the media to do it as well. Yeah, and it's also as well, look, just because something is easy and it gets clicks and it gets an instant hit, doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. Actually, what is more prudent is to take the longer route, work, work harder, and actually you're gonna get what you truly want. What you really, because most people, okay, once you get over the cheap dopamine hit of when something goes viral, if it's not something you're really proud about, it's not a good feeling. No, it's why it was hard back in the in the days with with a lot of right wingers because I became that person and was just mm. making stuff every day for clicks that was outrageous. Sometimes stuff that goes way beyond what I would believe, and it's just it's just bullshit. And it's why I didn't la it's why I didn't stay in it for very long as well. It's mm. why the people a lot of people I work with don't really exist now because they were doing the same thing. But um, yeah, it makes sense. One of the uh, final thing to explore I found interesting, particularly the contrast that I brought up with Lawrence is, I think the thing that happened, even though, I, as I said, I think what you said was much worse than what he said, actually, you apologize very quickly. And we live in an age where so many people think that apologizing when you've said something wrong is the wrong thing to do, as you, you people were telling you that afterwards. I actually think your example shows quite the opposite, which is if you said something wrong, which we all do, everybody the best thing to do if you've said something wrong genuinely that you regret is to apologize straight away yeah and and then to just be like look i apologize that's it and people will move on uh, a lot of the time yeah and i think it's why i think it surprised jk Rowling. it's why she replied three times to that apology saying like we all make mistakes please leave kane alone like you know it's fine like i really appreciate this apology and i replied and said i'm actually really in awe of this response this is really really respectful <clears throat> and gracious and there were so many people saying like that we need more of this on the internet because it doesn't happen mm. anymore. But there was also a lot of people on the left who were then furious at me and the place I was working for um, for for even apologizing or yeah, for fuck even those people though. Yeah, yeah I know, no, but seriously. it just shows how sad how sad that is because it's I think it was genuinely a good moment, like a nice moment yeah. it, that morning at like eight a.m. 
Um, but yeah. <laughs> but you know, you're always going to get the ideologues on either side. Yeah. You know, the people who go never apologize for anything. You're like, really? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're great to hang out with. Yeah. And the thing is, as well as for so many of these people, to your point about how the internet changes people, I go, never apologize. Is, is that is that what you teach your kids? Never apologize for anything? Because I don't think you do. And with many of these people, I've seen them with their children and they're good parents. I don't think you'd be teaching your children always double down. Yeah. <laughs> that's just that's, raising I, a mini Trump. Yeah, just. <laughs> but it's how we're teaching ourselves to behave now. I think yeah. going on Twitter, I think that actually is the attitude. It is to never apologize. It right. is to never back down. Yeah. And it's getting worse as we get more of our feed from, from the internet. I think that that's the core problem with it. And again, not seeing the other side as human beings and never apologizing to them because they're not people, are they? They should be, you know, thrown in prison. That's what they think. Well, there we go. Uh, we're about to go to locals and ask you questions from our supporters. But before we do, uh, the final question we always end with is, what's the one thing that we're not talking about that you think we should be? Before Kaylin answers the final question, make sure to head over to our locals at the end of the interview. The link's in the description to see this. Working with the right, uh, there was a lot more people I was surrounded with who really believed what they were doing and they really had a, a purpose. A lot of people on the left are driven by personality and money a lot more. How do you manage your propensity for extremes is, is his question. Well, I don't think what I was involved in was extreme. Well, I, th I think working with Alex Jones is extreme. Mm. Well, the one thing we should be talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that we're not. I mean, I guess, I mean, I, I just, my whole thing is I think we should just be doing more actual investigating and thinking for ourselves and we should be funding more investigations and actually looking at what's going on in the world and we should all just get off the internet for a while. That's just my end, that's my end philosophy with all of it. Perfect. Head on over to Locals where we ask Helen your questions. Stay on the internet. What's the best way to get someone to seriously consider arguments from the other side? 